Okay, everybody. Um, welcome. All of you look. I think all of you look like you need an infusion of caffeine, <laughs> intravenous, right? <laughs> Something to wake you guys up. But this is pretty normal for this um, this this time of the year, this time of the semester. Not so much this time of the year, but. Um, I'm a little, this is not very good, there are very, very few of you, fewer and fewer of you are turning up for the lectures, so we need to do something about that. Uh, one solution I think would be to turn the recording off, uh, the other solution would be, I guess, to send a message around. Um, it, no, this is really important because attendance always tends to drop, right, towards the end of the semester for, for many classes, and that's bad because a lot of the stuff that you need to know um, Probably the end lectures might well be more important than the early ones, which are introductions. So, um, um, anyway, we'll send a message around. One more uh, general announcement on Friday, and I think you know this already, um, Angie Lau from Bloomberg is going to be talking about journalism, careers in the journalism industry and so on. So, do turn up for that. Um, because these Friday ones, even though they're not, nobody takes attendance, but this is as much part of, of your education as uh, anything else that you do. And plus, I think you guys will find it really interesting. Um, if we didn't think it would be interesting, we wouldn't have called us. So do turn up, it's for, for, for your benefit. Okay, so today what we're going to talk about, what I want to talk about really is how many of you have worked in news organizations before? One, two, three, four. Okay, I'd about four of you have worked in news organizations. So I'm going to take you inside a news organization, a newspaper, and help you to understand the structure of a news organization. What actually happens there all day long? What are the different roles? What do people do there? Who does what? What do the different job titles mean? And this also leads up to a discussion on news budgets, on finding stories to do, and so on and so forth. Okay? So you guys ready to go? I would take that as a resounding yes. And let's see what the best lighting is. No, that's terrible. Everybody will go to sleep. You guys will all fall asleep. Let me leave it like that. Actually, for this slide, I am going to put it off. Um, the first thing to remember is that the news industry, a news organizer, the news industry is an industry. There's a reason why it is called the news industry, because it is an industry. It's an industry which produces a product. Just like soap, like shampoo, the newspaper industry produces this product. Right? Um, the broadcast industry produces products that are distributed on television. Mm -hmm. But these are products. And like all products, they are part of a pretty bureaucratic industrial process. It's exactly like car manufacturing cars or televisions or anything. Right? So they are elaborate structures, they are workflows. So literally, it is an industry. So how does this industry work and what does it look like from the inside? Now I've got a slide which is really, I couldn't get the, 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 um, the, the font any bigger. So let me try and get a marker up. Okay, so this is the typical structure of a newsroom. Uh, there's actually a lot more, but the, I couldn't get it all onto a slide. There are many, many more things which we will talk about as we, we, uh, as we go on. So this, for example, is the structure of the um, South China Morning Post newsroom. There's more stuff as well which we will talk about, but this is what it looks like, right? So on top, uh, right here, there is an editor or an editor-in-chief. Um, and the one thing to understand is that newsrooms are not democracies. News organizations are not democracies. They are very, very hierarchical organizations. And more often than not, what the b boss says happens. Even though this leads or can often lead to great frustrations with reporters and so on, but um, 
there you are. And also you could argue that somebody needs to take decisions and everybody may not like that decision but that's why this is so hierarchical. Now the Sci-Chi in the Morning Post, when I was editing the paper we had a newsroom, I had an editorial staff of 300 people. Right? So these are big organizations, that's a medium sized newsroom. So these are really really large structures and these 300, most of them were editorial staff, though a few of them were you know, typists or computer operators, attendants, car drivers and so on, but the bulk of them were editorial staff. So it's a big, big organization. Under that you will find a, a deputy editor or a managing editor and what the managing editor does is a lot of the day-to-day -day running of the newsroom. Now in different news organizations have got different terminologies for this. In the United States, for example, the managing editor would be the number one in the editorial uh, process and who would be responsible for all news. In, in British newspapers and in places like the South China Morning Post, the deputy editor or the managing editor is a manager who manages the newsroom and does everything from uh, stepping in for the editor when the editor is away to approving leave approving budgets, all that sort of stuff, right? Because the budgets, annual budgets are pretty big. Um, the SCMP for example has an annual budget or used to have of about 30 to 35 million US dollars, that's about 250 Hong Kong dollars, right? Which is pretty big. And that, process, that needs to be managed as well. Now here and I put, it I put it by the side, if I can get my pen to work again, that will be useful. Okay, well just follow the pen. Um, is the online multimedia desk. Now it's to the side because print news organizations are still grappling about how to link up these two things, the print and the online operations. Ten years ago, the, the sort of the slogan was print first, right? Uh, because print journalists generally hated to have their stories online. Why do you think that was? It seems a bit strange now, but why do you think that was? Sorry? No, not not not. I mean, you can still have the newspaper, but why was that? They didn't. They weren't very happy about. Um, putting their stories, you work on a story all day and then you put it online immediately, they didn't like that. They don't get paid for that? Uh, space is not... Newspaper okay, you, you think they... Yeah, it's not so much they wouldn't get space. The thing was that pay. if somebody pay. had an exclusive... Pay. Sorry? They don't get paid. Oh, we get paid so much, sorry. <laughs> that was part of the problem because people felt that they were, they were um, you know, having to work twice what they normally would, but that's a separate problem. The thing was that print journalists, having grown up in print, didn't want their competitors to know ahead of time the stories that they were working on or the exclusives. If I have an exclusive, a really big story, I work for a daily newspaper with a website and this goes up on the website at 6 o'clock in the evening that gives all my competitors enough time to try and match the story. You see the logic of that? So people got really upset saying, no, we can't do this and we're not going to give anything to online. And so for the first five, six, seven, eight years, online was completely squeezed. And what many newspapers, including the SCMP, used to do was to take the next day's stories and put them on the website, which is completely stupid. Putting stuff on a website which is 24 hours old makes absolutely no sense. And not updating it until the next 24 hours. It made absolutely no sense. But many newspapers were doing this because in the early years of print. Now of course all that has changed and most news organizations, the online operations are, have got their own editor, they're separate, they, get their, they share content but it's up to them to decide what they publish, when they publish and so on and so forth. Right? The SCMP also has improved a lot in, in, in terms of getting an independent um, online presence. Now here is 
Now under this are a whole bunch of section editors who look after different parts of the newspaper. Here is, I have written here, business editor, the Hong Kong news editor, China news, foreign news, sports, photo. And in addition, there are other, what are some of the other areas you think, I haven't been able to put everything in. What do you, can you think of some other? Culture, Culture entertainment, very big. If you're Apple Daily, the entertainment editor probably is the biggest, probably the <laughs> highest paid guy that there is there. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, what else? Political. Hmm? Political. Sorry, I didn't get that. Political. Political, yeah. Features. Opinion. Opinion, features. These are all different sections of, 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 of a newspaper. And each section editor will be in charge of his particular section. For example, uh, the SCMP has got a separate pullout for its business section, which is about um, 20 pages big. It's a quite a big thing. A lot of it is ads and stuff. But the business editor is in charge of this, which means it's his job to find enough stories to fill this every day, right? Minus the ads, and also to find good stories. And similarly with all the other section editors. Unfortunately, things like the foreign news editor is, is basically has very little job to do except because the South China Morning Post, like many newspapers, no longer has foreign correspondents. Uh, when I was there, the, we had a correspondent in Washington, we had a correspondent in Indonesia, um, Singapore, um, and uh, Hanoi, briefly, Vietnam, all of which were scrapped, and in London, all of which were scrapped uh, by about 2003, 2004 in order to cut costs. So now, for example, all the foreign editor does is take stories from Reuters and puts them into the newspaper. Which once more is a crazy thing to do because most people have seen these stories the previous day. And it's a complete waste of time and space. But there you go. And under each of these editors, we have, you will have reporters, right? Um, the photo editor, of course, has photographers. They're very often, they also, many newspapers have specialized graphic desks with a graphics editor, um, with graphic artists under, um, under him or her, right? So this is what it looks like. And this is a big, big structured organization. It's like working in a corporation, right? It's like working in an investment bank, except you get paid a lot less. But <laughs> the basic structures are the same. Now the way a news organization proceeds is through a series of meetings or, or conferences, news conferences. And there are two main news conferences in the course of the day. Um, one is the, um, sorry, let me just put the lights back on. I find it a little distracting, speaking into darkness. Um, but so the, um, the, the main news conference is in the morning. And this is chaired by the chief editor or the editor, and it has several purposes. Number one, how well have you done compared to your competitors, right? So unfortunately in Hong Kong, in the English language, they are no, well, the only competitor is a standard, which nobody takes very seriously. So one of the problems with a paper without competition, is competition good for a newspaper or not? What do you guys think? Yes. Yes. Why? The hard part of why it's the other way around. Yeah, and why it should not be. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And because you need to, without competition, what happens to a news organization? Lazy. You get very, very lazy because, hey, you know, you've got, you've got the whole English language market in Hong Kong. You're in a happy position whereby most of your readers cannot read the Chinese press, right? And so pretty, you can do pretty much what you want. Um, as long as you cover the main events of the day, one minute I come to you. But I mean, yeah, when I say pretty much what you want, there are limits to that as well. All of you have done the HKTV story, right? And I think, or at least my class and lots of classes have done it, which was a huge story. And I think when some of you in my class went on after four days of protests, you guys were wondering, 
Do we still keep saying protests are going on? Right? Um, and the answer is yes, because anybody who is passing by there, you see the whole of Government Square filled with people. And to not report on that, but look at some small angle, is not possible. Because people would say, hey, why aren't you covering this? So there's a limit to what it, when I say that you can get away with anything, there's a limit to I mean, take it in, a, you know, in inverted commas or with a big pinch of salt. But you do tend to get very complacent. Uh, because you've got nobody to compete with. So, um, one of the main functions of a morning meeting really is to look at the stories that have been missed, look at what your competitors are doing, and also to find out why these stories were missed. So this can be a difficult place if you've missed a story, right? If you're the business editor and your staff, your reporters have missed a huge story, um, that can be quite uncomfortable. And if you keep doing it day after day after day, you probably won't have a job. So these are fairly, these are very, uh, these are fairly rough places to work in, right? That's also where you get your satisfaction from. Number two, section editors provide their list of stories for the day, the so-called news budget, which um, we've been doing in class. I know Barry's class definitely has been uh, working on these. So at the morning meeting, they will produce, oh, anyway, hang on, I've got a photograph for you guys. Okay, I got this off the web, and this is, just to give you an idea what it looks like, this is the UK Guardian morning meeting, it was on their website. And so pretty much, these either happen in the editor's office, which is a small cramped space, or in small conference rooms. So I, I would say this is fairly typical, a bunch of people sitting around a table with their lists of stories for the day. Right? So each section editor and each of these guys sitting there heads one of the sections of the newspaper. Okay? So you come with your lists of stories for the day and you read them out to the editor and to your colleagues. Now you may ask yourself, how do you already know what stories you're going to be doing for the day. Surely news is something that just happens, isn't it? So how do you know in advance? Some of them are scheduled assignments, like already announced events which are coming yeah. up. Some of them are already announced. How many of, you, of them do you think are already announced? Closer to 80 to 90 percent. No? So on the one hand, we have this idea of news as something that's just happening, it's spontaneous, we need to go out and cover it. But most news events are prearranged. You've got press releases telling you what to do, you've got PR people telling you what to do, politicians who, are, who you know, got people in government. Every government press conference you know at least two days in advance. Right? So a lot of this, unfortunately, is prearranged. Because it is prearranged, every news organization covers exactly the same thing. You can get different angles, right? But once more, this is an industry, and like all industries, we tend to work like herds or flocks of sheep, right? We follow the same things. Oh, wow, see why long press conference, everybody goes there. And you need to go there, right? Because everybody else is there, and it's important. Um, the only unfortunate thing about this is that there's so many things that are never signaled through press releases and press conferences that we tend to miss because we are so busy running after the things that are already nicely signaled. Otherwise, oh, if the business, anything a company is giving, its, is giving out its annual report and its figures, we know that well in advance. And the company's PR company would have given you a nice glossy folder uh, full of all the facts and figures that you need to do and so on and so forth. So it also becomes a lot easier um, and this is the way it is and I think this probably is one of the problems that the news industry has to break out of. So what is discussed store at the morning meeting? Story angles, packages, um, and photos and graphics as well. For example, 
if I think my class we looked at the uh, SCMP coverage of one of the HKTV Hong Kong TV protest days and I think on that day they had three stories one on the front page which looked at gave you an overall picture there was one story just on the celebrities who had attended and there was a third story I think on um, on what people at the protest were saying right uh, no sorry the third story is what the government is doing so things like this are planned out we discuss this so the Hong Kong news editor will say HKTV is going to be big and then you'll have a discussion okay what's new about it? what's going to happen today LegCo is going to discuss it there's going to be a huge protest this British singer whoever he was is going to come and sing there and so on and so forth and so the Hong Kong news editor would explain first of all how he plans to cover it I'm going to send you you know three of my people are going to be at uh, in with the protesters I've got two people who are going to be covering the LegCo etc etc so all of this is discovered and the photo editor will say and the editor will say okay what are we doing for photographs and the photo editor will say I'm going to have three people there 24 hours or whatever it is right and then you have other discussions as well okay this protest has been going on for seven days how about we have some sort of a timeline what happened on each of these days right and so the graphics editor then will say okay I can do a really nice timeline and so on and so forth right so packages are put together and to be honest this is one of the nice things I mean newspapers will probably be <coughs> in the form that we know I don't think are going to last more than the next 10 to 15 years right but they're still wonderful products and they really are products and the process of putting this package together every day putting together the news of the day in as interesting a way as possible it's a wonderful thing and I hope we don't lose all of it once print goes so um, this is what uh, the morning meeting would discuss so number one what are the stories we missed why did we miss them number two what are we going to be doing for tomorrow's paper how are we going to be covering it right and this could even be something like you know hey there's this typhoon has hit the Philippines we've got 20 Hong Kong tour we've got 200 Hong Kong tourists stranded there so how do we cover it and somebody will ask the editor hey do we have money can we can we fly three people over right and if the budget is there yes so maybe you send a photographer and two reporters over there and get them on the first flight to uh, Manila or, or, or wherever so all of that is done here Now here is the real, real challenge which most many newspapers, especially the SCMP, is not even attempting. And this is the whole issue. What do you tell people about things they already know? This newspaper is printed at 3 a.m. in the morning, right? The whole, and it's about things that happened the previous day, which you've already watched on television, you watched online what do you tell people now it's hard 10 years ago it was really easy or 20 years ago it was even easier you were the only source of information you had radio you had television but even then you didn't have 24-hour television right um, you 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 had regular news slots maybe 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. once a day news perhaps but you didn't have 24 hour news so it was pretty easy so this is the huge challenge that newspapers are facing and not many of them are doing a very good job the SCMP definitely is not and this is a problem we had even then um, this is the SCMP's front page today right can you guys see it well you can see a little bit so the main story here is death toll in super typhoon tops 10,000 now this has been on every news broadcast for the last 24 hours at least right so what sense does it make to give away your prime news spot to some for something that you everybody already knows we know it's terrible and so the question then becomes what do you tell people 
I'm going to show you the front page. I'm going to see, show you what the New York Times does. Um, and in fact, some of you, I think I shared newspapers that I had brought back from last week. But Okay, NY Times. It's probably the best I can do it. See if I can get full screen. Ah, oh, no, sorry. Okay, let's try it this way. Okay, this is um, yesterday's New York Times. Well, today it's still given the 12 hour difference. And if you look at the front pages, you will see that there is virtually no breaking news. The Philippine story, there's a big dramatic photograph, right? But anything about the, about the hurricane, the, the typhoon itself is way inside. Look at the stories they have on the front page. One is about new, China, new cities in China. And it's about, um, I haven't read the story actually, but I think it's about the quality of construction. You know, there's this huge push for urbanization. So people are moving, all these new buildings are being made and there are fairly, um, I suspect the quality of construction is a little less, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what the story is. But once more, this is not news, right? It's something deeper than the news. This is a political story. Um, and it says, as Washington keeps sinking, governors rise. And they've looked at the phenomenon that w whereby the president and members of Congress, the US federal government in Washington is held in really low esteem by the public. State governors are extremely popular and they're increasing their popularity, right? So there seems to be the shift in power. Uh, well, not necessarily shift in power, but this is an interesting phenomenon, right? Uh, People are fed up with politics in Washington, but local leaders are doing well. They're managing to engage with, with citizens. They're managing to do good stuff and so on and so forth. Once more, this is not news, right? Not breaking news. Huh? It's not breaking news. It is not breaking news. It's, 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 it's a trend. And if you look at the writing style as well, none of these are in a, you know, who, what, why, where, when um, uh, format. And this once more, I think we've looked at, all our classes have looked at this. Um, up here is a story. Um, the New York Times has been doing this whole series on Obamacare and the problems that it has run into, both from the point of view of insurers, from the point of view of ordinary people, and so on and so forth. So here there is one about fraud. Um, you know, in the insurance market. So they've done a story about that. Once more, this is not breaking news. It's not something that happened yesterday, right? These are trends. Um, one more story. This is a story about, we know that the big story is that People in Europe and all the US's allies are really pissed off because the US National Security Agency has been tapping into all their phone calls, right? This is a story that says, hey, when Obama travels abroad, foreign leaders are doing the same thing to him, and so he has all his meetings inside this secure tent, right? So he stays in all these luxury hotels, but he also pitches a tent outside for, um, for his secure um, conversations and so on and so forth. Interesting story, but is this hot breaking news? No. So you can see the strategy of the New York Times, right? Saying that, let's not tell people, sorry, there was, there's one exception, which actually is a straight news story and something that happened 
previous day, and that is this one out here. Um, there are ongoing, there are talks between the United States and Iran going on in Geneva, and on Sunday, or rather on 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 Sunday, well Saturday Sunday, they. Uh, broke down without agreement but they all agreed to meet 10 days later or whatever. So in a sense this would have been covered by you know CNN and uh, many news organizations but they have nevertheless um, done a big story. They've, I think they've got two of their correspondents there so they probably put in a lot of background, put in a lot of analysis and so on and so forth. But this is the only sort of breaking news story that they have done. Now you guys, it, it's obvious that this is a lot harder to do, right, than just repeating what has already happened. Because you constantly need to look for new angles, new stories, new ways of telling a story. And this is the challenge for reporters, for print reporters in the electronic age, right? Um, it's a lot harder, but it's a lot more rewarding. You're no longer like members of a flock of sheep, charging after, you know, running whenever there's a press conference held and writing down whatever everybody says, but your job is much more, it's a lot deeper now. Any questions so far? You guys are really silent. Okay, so that really sums up what I had to say. Um, yeah, sorry, sure. You sorry, Aaron. <laughs> you need to stand up and, yeah? Um, can you tell us a little bit about working, like, working with journalists and working with the press and working So, all right, actually, that's a good this thing. Now, uh, thank you for reminding me. That was actually the second part of my, um, which, which I got carried away with. Thank you. Now, each editor, let's say the business editor, will have reporters who are assigned to specific beats. Actually, I was going to talk about this when I talk about beats, which I think is, yeah, a little further up. But let me go ahead, since you've asked the question. Um, Okay, anyway, let's leave this here and I'll tell you about this. So, let's look at each of those sections. There's a business editor. The business editor will have reporters who have different beats. What is a beat? A specific area. For a business, it could be capital markets, it could be the property, it could be tourism, it could be any of these different industries, each of which has a reporter sort of covering that. Right? Logistics is really big, it's one of the big drivers still of the Hong Kong economy. Uh, tourism is really big, so each of these will have specific reporters following just that. So what does a reporter do? Now the business editor, when he goes to the morning meeting with this whole list of stuff, these are the things that are happening. Now this list is not something that's come out of his head. He would have a prior meeting with the reporters under him, right, to figure out what are the big stories, okay? And so, Jeff, if you are covering the tourism industry, you would say like, hey, Hong Kong, the Tourism Development Corporation uh, is having a press conference and they're going to announce that the government is going to pump in, you know, $250 million over the next year in this big come visit Hong Kong campaign, right? A global campaign. And so that's how these things um, um, uh, sort of get onto the list. Now, as a reporter, what does your editor expect from you? On the one hand, if there's a press conference, go and cover it. Come back, write an interesting story, get your facts right, get your deadline right. Don't hang about saying, and this I mean, even at the beginning, trying to figure out, oh, I don't know where this press conference is. is. 
right? Uh, how do I get to this place? Now some of these are legitimate questions, but most of these questions you need to figure out really quickly, right? Um, ask colleagues, go to maps, ring somebody up, but <laughs> life lessons. If you're given an assignment, don't say, how do I get there? It's for you to figure <laughs> out, all right? Um, just go and come back with the story. Um, so you would go, you would cover a story, and when you come back, typically you would go to your editor and say, this, hey, this is what the guy said, right? Um, and the editor would ask you, first of all, is there anything new here? And you would say, yeah, well, every year they put in about a hundred million dollars, but this time they've doubled the amount that they put in, right? So maybe then he would say, okay, that seems a good angle. Do you know why they did it? And in which case you should be able to say why, either because they said in the press conference or because you asked that question. Don't scratch your head, oh, he didn't say why, <laughs> all right? So this is where you really need to be switched on. Um, and be intelligent, be critical, right? If somebody is standing up and telling, say, uh, <laughs> saying something in a press conference, ask yourself, why is this guy speaking? What is new here, right? It, does he just want publicity for himself and so on and so forth? So you need to get all of that stuff, right? Then you come back, you write your story. And once more it will go to either the business editor, or if he's got it's a big, big, big business desk, to another editor who will look at it. If there are holes in the story, it will come back to you saying, hey, you know, you haven't talked to anybody in the hotel industry. Are there enough hotel rooms in Hong Kong if we have this huge influx of tourists? Right? So go find that out. Or maybe it'll be a good story for the next day. So this is the process that happens in the newsroom. Right? Um, Aaron, does, does that answer your question pretty much? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. Eric, I think. <laughs> okay. okay, so all of that is done in the morning meeting, right? Ah, okay, folks. Can you guys think of any angle? Now I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes only. The Philippine typhoon story. Okay, you're an SCMP Hong Kong reporter. What angle can you think of it? Can you think of a new angle for that? How the um, Philippine community in Hong Kong contacted yeah. their families? Yeah. Contacted their families? Have there been losses? I mean, have lots of people sp uh, spending, uh, sending money home. Is it easy to send money home, right? If you're in one of these devastated places, are people struggling to send money home? Who do they go to to send money? Do they go to a bank or is there these commission agents? I mean, there are millions of things. And plus, stories of, you know, maybe people have lost children, maybe people have lost families. I mean, it, it can be really traumatic. And we've got about a hundred thousand people from the Philippines and Hong Kong, right? 100, 150,000. So it's a big sector, of, of, uh, it's, it's not a small amount, so that's an obvious thing to do. Any other ideas on what you might do? Hong Kong tourists? Hmm? Do you know if there are Hong Kong tourists? Yeah, yeah. are there Hong Kong tourists struck, um, um, stuck there? Absolutely right. So this is the sort of thing, and if you go, I mean, once you're working, you need to be able to come up with these ideas, right? Uh, not scratch your head. So even before you go into a meeting, be prepared saying, hey, I've got this really good idea, which means that, you know, you need to be thinking about these things all the time. What can I do? What story can I give, right? What's a new, what new idea do I have? Now, look at the SCMP. This is today's SCMP, right? And they've actually done, after three days, they've actually done the Filipino story. But this is really poorly done. They've <laughs> inter interviewed a few people and got a few quotes and put it up there. Instead, this we already know. This should have been the angle for this, right? And if you had use this as the main sort of entry point into the story and then talked about you know additional things about the destruction and so on later it would have been a much more relevant story right um, another interesting thing you know the the hong kong television controversy it's been going on for how long now 
more I think I think most of you guys covered it at least a week ago when it was already a week old uh, yes. yeah so I think it's two weeks right two, three months. yeah three for the first time today we're getting some details about how that decision was taken two weeks later right and this was by somebody an ex-member of ledge co who said that you know three people did not voted against the motion so it was not unanimous so there's this ex legco member who's saying that you know we've never taken non-unanimous decisions before oh wow yes <laughs> yeah. and it took two weeks for this to come out what should a smart reporter have done on day one well i mean they should presumably use their power as a prominent newspaper to insist on answers no, just talk to people, find out, okay, what is this exco? How do they take decisions, right? Can somebody tell me about what kind of decision, what, was there a lot of discussion? What kind of discussion was going on, right? And contact present exco members, past exco members, anybody whom you know. 90, lots of people will not talk to you, but you knock on enough doors, somebody will. And you've got a great story there, right? Um, but it's appalling that it took two weeks to answer a really obvious question. How was this decision taken? Right? Who opposed it and what ground? Now, the, a lot of it is there's, there, there is a rule of confidentiality within, the ex, within EXCO. So nobody can really tell you that, you know, hey, I said this, hey, I didn't say this. But you can talk to people on the outside, people who know what's going on and who would tell you that this is unusual. So this is once more, is the whole process of being nimble and getting new angles. And most news stories don't really address, especially breaking news stories, the why and how question, right? So big protests, big protests, LegCo is saying this, government is saying this, everybody is saying things, right? But why was this decision taken? How was it taken? Did nobody understand? Did nobody realize that there would be this huge uh, uproar? Now we also know that the government has got its own public opinion findings. I mean, they, they do regular, weekly, even daily polls of public opinion, right? How did they miss this? It's a huge story. It's a huge, I mean, it, it, it's a real mess, right? So this is where you keep probing, you will get really interesting stories. How do you get interesting stories? By developing a beat. So if you're doing politics, you would just do politics. If you're covering government, you're covering the chief executive's office, you're covering Exco, you're covering LegCo, within a month to two months, you need to know just about everybody there. Oh, at least, or at least a significant proportion of people. You need to go, you need to meet people, you need to talk to people, you need to have coffee with people right um, get their phone numbers give them your phone numbers almost until they get sick of you it doesn't matter if they get sick of you right at least they know you <laughs> and, um, and as long as they pick up your phone call and they respond to you and as long as you're not a complete uh, you know they don't think you're completely crazy this is you need to build these relationships okay I'm going to move on a little fast now the next stage, at the end of the day, we started with the morning conference. There's one more conference in between, uh, which different newspapers have, and that really is the conference to decide on the day's editorials, the leader conference. And most newspapers have anything from three to 30 full-time editorial leader writers who would be under an op-ed op -ed page editor. Right? So they would have a meeting as well, and the editor-in-chief would be involved in that. In most newspapers, U.S. newspapers have this clear distinction between the news side and the opinion side. Other newspapers don't. Everything comes under the editor-in-chief. So that would happen as well. But the evening conference is when everybody comes back, and typically this would happen around 6, 6 p.m. And the section editors now would come back with their stories, right? And each of them would pitch their, or they should be pitching their best stories for the front page, right? 
So let's go back to that example of Jeff having gone to cover this Hong Kong tourism um, press conference. And if the business editor thinks that's the best story that he has, he would say that, you know, hey, this is an interesting story from Hong Kong tourism. They're going to double their um, the amount that they're spending on trying to attract tourists. However, um, this is going to create a whole bunch of problems, including infrastructure, hotel space, etc., etc., etc. And so I think this will be a great page one story. So that will go down. The foreign editor will say, hey, I've just hired somebody, a freelancer in Manila, um, who's tracking down this group of Hong Kong tourists who might be caught there. So I've just sent this guy to, you know, maybe one of the resorts. I don't know where exactly it's hit. And he's going to call me back in an hour and a bit. But I think there are about 20, 25 Hong Kong tourists there. So I think this will be a great front page story. And similarly, people would pitch stories, right? Many section editors, however, do very sneaky things. They hold back their best stories. They don't tell anybody. Why is that? Because they also need to fill 20 pages here. Right? So they don't want to send all their stories to the front page, especially the good ones, because they say, hi, my business section, I want a really good story here. And I want to save that tourism story for here. So this is when the editor says, you know, sort of shakes people, hangs them by their heels for a little bit until all the good stories come out. Uh, because the editor's <laughs> interest really is getting a really, really good paper as a whole, right? So that's what happens. Then you take a decision on what the main story is going to be, as well as the other stories on the front page. And this is done at the morning, at, at, the, at the evening conference. And to be honest, I think this is probably the most interesting and useful process, because not so much today, but historically, Newspapers, most newspaper sales were newsstand sales. You didn't subscribe so much, but every day you went to work, you stopped outside the MTR, you picked up a newspaper, right? And typically you would have choice of newspapers. And very often people's decision, or at least newspapers think so, is based on what they see just in this top half, right? So this is the most precious part in terms of real estate for a newspaper, right? So the photographs, uh, the lead or the splash as it is known, um, and plus you advertise what is inside as well on, 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 um, on top of these um, gears. Then you decide photographs and once more, I don't know why, I'm sorry to pick on the SCMP but <laughs> this is terrible. Um, take Filipinos in Hong Kong try to help loved ones. Okay, look at the size of the photograph. Can you see it? You need a microscope or, or get, get a telescope. You'll be able to see this little. Now this is a complete waste of space and a complete waste of a photograph, right? First of all, you don't know what this is, right? Um, and it, and, and it, a reader's eye will just go over it. It's complete, it's a complete waste of space. So things like planning the page, laying out the page, deciding what photos to use, what stories to use, etc., etc. And typically this can be a long process. In the SCMP it is not, but in a newspaper like the New York Times, which I don't know how many stories a day they generate, um, it can be quite a long process of you know, um, uh, figuring out what goes where. So at the, at the evening meeting, what, we, uh, what, what normally happens is that the front page is decided, the photos, the stories, and so on. And normally, the top stories for each of the sections, okay? And so the China editor will say, um, for the China section, my big story on page, whatever, is going to be this one. This is the photographs I have, etc., etc., etc. So that goes on. Once that is decided, the newspaper goes to the last stage, which once more, sorry, this is easier. So the section editors will go back with their lists of what's going on the front page. Um, stories will start going 
to the copy desk. So this is a two-stage production process. The stories that reporters turn are first roughly edited by the section editor, and that's mainly for the angle, right? If you missed an important angle, it's your business editor or your section editor who'll say, hey, you missed the story completely. Why don't we, you know, we had a story exactly like this a week ago, but let's try, let's move this up into the lead. It makes it much more interesting. It then goes to the copy desk. Now the copy desk is often seen, it is really the last line of defense for a newspaper. Because if there are mistakes in the paper, this is the last stage that you can get it out. And this could be anything from typos to spelling errors to getting names wrong to getting dates wrong, all of that. So the copy desk does that. They edit it line by line for grammar, for spelling, but also for facts. Uh, make sure that the story really makes sense. And then they send it on to the production desk. The production desk is where it is actually laid out on a page. right? So um, the evening conference, at the end of that, there'll be a sort of a mock-up of what the front page and every page should look like. So the production desk then starts. They will coordinate with the photo desk saying, you know, hey, when's this photo coming for page six? Um, how big is it? How good is it? Shall I put it on top of the page, etc., etc. So they will start then setting out and laying out um, the pages. Um, the editor usually takes one last look around 11, 30, 12 before it goes to sleep, um, before the papers sort of, um, you know, at least one of the editions uh, start printing. And, um, and that is, uh, that pretty much it, is it. And the next morning, you get this. Right. Questions? Thoughts? Um, well, I mean, to participate in the entire process uh, is a very long day, right? It is a long day, yes. which is why people work shifts. Right. So, for example, the copy desk, most people will, will only start turning up, not before 3 in the afternoon, or 4 in the afternoon, right? Except, I mean, feature desks and so on start a little early because they finish early. But people work in shifts, normally six-hour shifts, so on the copy desk there will normally be two shifts. Uh, one would do some of the, and each page has got a specific time at which it goes to sleep. For example, the foreign pages would be done really early, and they would got out of the way, um, and so on and so forth. The front page would be the last page, because if anything big happens, that's where it's going to go. When it gets exciting, of course, is when something really big happens, which is once every, I don't know, 365 days, something that forces you to, you know, scrap the front page. Okay, we need to change it entirely, take this story out, put this one in, get this, etc., etc. The most classic example when, 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 when I was editing a paper was 9 11, uh, which was uh, a, a, an amazing, amazing um, experience. And I still remember it's about, I think, around 8 mm -hmm. o'clock in the evening, Hong Kong time, right? Pretty much. Uh, suddenly, we were watching, I think, I was sitting in the newsroom and we were watching um, one plane crash and we think, wow, you know, somebody, the pilot is really screwed up or air traffic control is really screwed up. And at that point of time, you're thinking, okay, we need, maybe we need to get something, maybe get a photo story, right, of uh, planes crashing into, we didn't know how big it was going to be. Then the second one came, right? And then suddenly at the back of everybody's mind saying, hey, Twice? No. And then, I think within an hour, there was a report that a plane had crashed just outside the Pentagon. And then it was quite clear by, for everybody this was war of some kind. Right? And so I think that day um, nobody went home. In fact, we worked 24 hours. And, um, and we even had the last edition actually came out around 6 a.m because this thing was big and all we did was really change the front page and but I think a lot of the time was spent on deciding what the front page would be and finally it was just an image of the Twin Towers which is what most people did um, 
with the logo moved up there. And I, I must remember what we came up with finally, I think. Something along the lines of this is war or, you know, an act of war or I forget what it was. And I think it was a quote from um, something that Bush said. I forget now. Um, so, but things like that don't happen very often. You do get smaller things happening. If there's a big accident, for example, right? Um, then you need to think about what do we, in, should it be on the front page? How big is it? Do we get it up here? And so on and so forth. So that definitely makes life exciting. That's when the adrenaline starts working and you get really pumped up and nobody wants to sleep. Yeah? Uh, I wanted to find out how you, you balance advertising with uh, your content. So sometimes you open a newspaper and you go through it, you only find a lot of adverts and you don't really get the news that you want to yeah. get. But also, again, I wanted to find out how you allocate resources Okay, in terms of money, uh, f uh, yeah. Okay, first of all, coming down to advertisement. Now, it's a sad fact of life that I think this sells for nine dollars now. This nine dollars, pretty much, what do you think nine dollars pays for? Cost of paper and printing. That's it, right? Everything else is paid for by this ads, right? So there is this constant push from the ad department to open up more and more ad space and they will keep selling pretty late. So suddenly if for example on this page you have filled up up to about here and suddenly there's this call saying hey we've just you know, sold a quarter page right where can it go and then there's all that juggling going on but the section editors worst nightmare is if the ad department in the morning says okay we've sold this so you only need three stories right and suddenly the ad say I'm sorry they, they pull the ad <laughs> right so you need to find you need to fill what uh, each of these is probably about uh, 800 to a thousand words so one two three you need to fill one two three four five columns um, of, of maybe about is it about three thousand words you need to find so you you tend to use a lot of pictures I think in that <laughs> circumstances or you use lousy stories um, yeah how, how what do you do with how are budgets allocated now this is an issue the South China Morning Post still is a very rich newspaper because it's a newspaper it's got a monopoly of the English language newspaper uh, in market in a very rich city right so it has money it's got a big editorial so we used to have I don't know any of the figures right now I must confess so I'm, I'm really talking from um, uh, past experience and how is that allocated now in the old days budgets used to actually go up in the good old days in Hong Kong but budgets are either flat or they are reducing so I would assume now even if somebody resigns retires it's pretty hard to get somebody to replace that position right um, and that position probably will not get filled so it's hard um, as I told you earlier all the foreign bureaus have been uh, shut up uh, there, there are no foreign correspondents anymore so okay I get a feeling we've run out of time so <laughs> see you all <laughs>